All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Savage. I'm a legislative associate here at the League. Uh, this will be my sixth session involved in legislative affairs. Uh, the past three years have been at the League, and the previous three years before that has been at the House of Representatives. So uh, I've, I've kind of seen just about a little bit of everything uh, in a lobbying capacity in the past three years, and as a staffer at the House, have seen you know, pretty much every aspect of the process. But really the goal of this particular presentation is just to kind of give you a brief overview of what, what essentially what's going on at the Capitol. It's to help you, uh, you know, whether you're a city or town, elected official or staff, uh, to develop a more comprehensive knowledge of the legislative process. So when you are either at the Capitol, up in the gallery, watching the floor debates, the committee testimony, or perhaps the floor votes, uh, you'll have a general understanding of what's going on. But if at any time you're watching on uh, remotely on the legislature's website and you have any questions, you wanna know why your particular bill is stalled in the process or there's a procedural motion that you don't quite understand, we're happy to help. Um, you can contact the league, contact the legislative staff, uh, myself, Tom Savage, or Nick Ponder, our legislative director, or Alex Vidal, who's also uh, a legislative associate. We're happy to walk you through the issue, uh, take a look at your bill, um, and see uh, where it is in the process, and perhaps you know assist you in any way that we possibly can. Now, the other goal of this presentation is to help you learn how you can impact legislation. Uh, first and foremost, the best and really the only way that you're gonna know whether you know, your particular issue uh, is gonna have any traction at the Capitol or is gonna be counting your votes. Uh, counting the votes on the committee that the bill is assigned to, uh, count your votes with your legislative delegation uh, and just generally meeting with legislators to kind of get an understanding of where they stand on your issue, uh, what their concerns are, and see how you can address them to uh, move forward your, uh, your bill or your issue. Establishing relationships with your legislature or with your legislators is absolutely important. Uh, I would say establishing and maintaining those relationships throughout the year, not just when the legislature comes into session. You know, that could mean, you know, going out, getting lunch, catching up, uh, getting coffee, talking about issues that your city and town uh, is having and making sure that uh, your legislative delegation has, uh, is kept up to speed on what's happening within your community. When you do that, uh, the third bullet point becomes rather easy. You've become a resource to that elected official. They're going to count on you for information, whether it be, you know, if a bill comes up of particular interest to cities, they might text you, they might call you, um, and, and that, that's a good thing. That means that you are a trusted resource. They rely on you for that information. And, and that's, that's a definitely a good thing. Keeping in contact as much as possible. Like I said before, don't just maintain that contact during the legislative session. You really wanna maintain that, those relationships uh, throughout the year, even when the legislature's not in session. Uh, committee testimony, meeting do's and don'ts. Uh, as far as testimony goes, if you're testifying on a bill, you just want to make sure you keep your comments brief um, and, and succinct as possible. Generally speaking, you're only going to have anywhere between two to three minutes to make comments on a bill and committee. So it's best to keep your point as uh, your points, your talking points as succinct as possible, and answer any questions um, and, and when, when questions come if you miss something in your opening comments you can use that as an opportunity to elaborate on on your uh, your talking points now just a kind of general overview of the legislature um, Arizona has uh, consolidated legislative districts there are 30 in the state uh, each district has two members in the state house, the lower chamber, 
add one uh, representative in the upper chamber of the state senate. Uh, there's very few states in the U.S. that have consolidated legislative districts like Arizona. And, and, and my last count, I think there's only six. And just to name a few, Idaho, Maryland, the Dakotas, Washington State, uh, New Jersey, just to name a few examples of legislatures that are consolidated like Arizona. In other states, you might see uh, an upper chamber district, uh, a Senate district, and maybe uh, a separate uh, assembly or house district. It could be that the Senate district overlaps maybe one or two different uh, house districts. It really just depends. Um, state senators and representatives, they're elected every two years and they're subject to uh, term limitations. Uh, they can serve four two-year terms. Um, and, and some of you may be wondering, well, I, I know uh, my legislator has served in the legislature for longer than that. Well, that's because um, they can switch houses. And, and when they do that, they, the clock restarts on their term limitations. So if they've been in the House for eight years, they might swap the seat with their Senate counterpart. Either their Senate counterpart may be retiring or they've made an agreement that they'll uh, switch spots um, so that way they can continue on serving uh, their their legislative district. Generally speaking, uh, legislature la or legislative session lasts about 100 days. Uh, this year we're looking at a January 14th start. We hope it doesn't go longer than 100 days, um, but it really just depends on what the issues are. Generally speaking, the budget is the issue that usually causes the legislature to uh, extend session beyond 100 days. Uh, it, it really just depends. Uh, there's, there's no really way to tell uh, how long session is going to be. 100 days is established in rule, and quite often we see that 100 days be extended if there are issues, like I said, the budget, or perhaps there's a, a monumental piece of legislation that they need to work some votes on. They might extend uh, session longer so they can get those votes and adjourn sine die and go home for the summer. League of Cities and Towns, we are an interest group. We are an association. We represent the interests of the incorporated municipalities in the state. We're not the only association that has a presence at the Capitol. And just to name a few, uh, Association of Counties, another local government organization that represents the other elected officials, such as you know, the sheriff, the assessor, and those types of positions. Uh, County Supervisors Association, that's the um, the association that represents the legislative bodies of the 15 counties. Uh, other examples of associations with presences at the Capitol, the Cattlemen's Association, uh, in terms of environment, the Sierra Club, uh, Fresh Vegetable Association, uh, Chambers of Commerce, there's just, there's a number of interests at the Capitol that have either hired lobbyists, uh, for just about anything that you can think of, any kind of issue, there's probably an association for that, or there's probably a lobbyist around the Capitol that's representing that issue in some form or fashion. So where do the bills come from? Well, they come from a few different sources. Uh, they can come from the general public. You know, if, if you, um, you as a citizen, if you know your legislator, you can meet with them, bring up issues, make suggestions for changes to law. Uh, if you've had issues with you know, a state agency that think merits a change in statute, uh, meet with your legislator, you can suggest changes. Legislator, uh, when they hear your concerns or suggestions, they may agree and decide to open up a bill folder with legislative counsel and drop that bill in either the House or the Senate and, and count votes and see through it to the end. Local governments, counties, cities, towns, we have our legislative agendas that we 
In fact, uh, League has our municipal policy statement. We adopted our legislative agenda at the League annual conference. Uh, we are hopeful that we are able to accomplish that entire agenda uh, this coming session. Um, but but we do uh, approach legislators to draft and, and sponsor and champion bills for us. State agencies also have legislation that they run to try to make their processes more efficient uh, if, or establish new programs to offer more services to the public. Uh, businesses and interest groups, that's where we see a lot of uh, legislation being offered, you know, from chambers of commerce or from the other interest groups that I, I mentioned previously, the, the Cattlemen's, the uh, Sierra Club, you know, all those different types of interest groups do offer uh, and, and, and ask legislators to sponsor legislation. Other examples, uh, special reports and audits. Uh, one example, a few years ago, uh, the government property lease excise tax audit that the Auditor General conducted had suggested some uh, re suggested reforms to uh, the GPLIT program and the associated statutes. Uh, Representative Vince Leach from District 11 uh, from Tucson was the one that championed those bills. Um, so legislation can come from uh, suggestions from audits or special reports. Uh, lastly, is ideas from previous legislative sessions. Sometimes bills just don't die, no matter how, how many times they keep coming back and they just never get enough votes to support. One example of that would be uh, photo radar enforcement. For the, I would say probably every year since I've been at the legislature, there's been some piece of legislation that's been offered uh, with regard to either photo radar enforcement on state highways or within cities and towns. Last session, uh, there was a bill with regard to photo radar enforcement. Passed the House, didn't get a hearing in the Senate. Uh, same issue happened the year prior, um, and we fully anticipate that that bill will be coming back again, uh, and don't know if there's going to be a different story as to the, how, how that bill ends up. So we kind of talked about a little bit where bills come from. Now we want to know how, how does that idea get transformed into legislative language that legislators offer and discuss and debate and vote on. So like I was saying before, if, if you as a member of the public, you have an idea of a change to state law, you sit down with your legislator, you make your case, you uh, explain the issue, the history. If the legislator agrees and says, I think that's a great idea, and I, I agree with your position that we ought to change state law, uh, then they will call legislative council and open up a bill folder. Legislative council is a nonpartisan uh, agency of the legislature governed by a, a body of legislators. Um, and what legislative council's job is, is to conduct the research on legislation and also they are the drafters of bills. And so that is the agency that the legislators will interface with if they're gonna um, offer and draft legislation. After legislative council um, finds the pertinent statutory language that needs to be amended to meet the legislator's goal on what changes they want, that will be turned into an intro set, which is essentially what the bill looks like before it's given a number. Uh, just have the, the plain statutory language, the changes in law, if there's additions to law, it's gonna be in blue up style language. Uh, deletions from law is gonna be in red stricken language. Uh, once once that process is done, then it is ready to uh, be introduced either in the House or the Senate. So it, obviously only legislators can introduce legislation. They're the only ones that are authorized to drop bills, the interest sets into what is called the hopper, which is essentially the, 
the, the receptacle of bills as they're introduced. It's either in the chief clerk's office or the Senate secretary's office. And once that's conducted, then staff processes it, issues a number. If you're a House legislator, obviously you can only introduce legislation in the House. Those bills are going to start with a two. Uh, 2001 is, is the first bill that the legislature starts with. And like in the Senate, if you're a senator, you're going to introduce legislation in the Senate. It's going to start with 1001 and just keep going up from there. Um, then after that comes first and second reading. Now, first reading is the bill is giving a, a, a first is being first read on either the House or the Senate floor. That's the first introduction of that legislation. Now, this is where the the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House make determinations on where the legislation should be assigned to, which committee of jurisdiction. So, generally speaking, if the issue has to do with taxes. If it's in the House, it's probably gonna to go to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, same in the Senate, if it has to do with taxes, it's probably gonna to go to finance. It's up to the Speaker or the President to um, determine which committees they go to. They, they are the ones that form the committees and seat them, and so they make the decision on um, which pieces of legislation go to, to which committee. So really now is the time to talk about what the role of the committee is. So each committee has a chairman, a vice chairman, and, 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 and other members, rank and file members, um, also a ranking member from the minority party. Um, and these are where issues are vetted, bills are vetted. They can be assigned uh, to numerous committees. So if, if the speaker wants to assign a particular bill to two or three committees, he or she has the power to do that. Uh, the most I've seen bills get assigned uh, is about three committees. And that could be because the speaker wants to see each committee um, with jurisdiction over that issue, um, have that issue vetted um, and offer any amendments if there's any issues. Or it could be uh, for political reasons. It could be as a way to, to stall the bill. So it, it's unlikely to get a hearing and meet the deadlines for um, getting out of the House and going over to the Senate uh, in time to meet the deadline. Same thing for the Senate over to the House. Each committee has staff. Uh, they're research analysts. That's what I used to be over in the House. Uh, they're very knowledgeable in their subject matters. Uh, they are available if you have any questions about uh, committee rules, uh, amendment deadlines, or just general questions about a uh, particular subject area. Um, but obviously, you know, if you have any of those questions, you're more than welcome to contact the league uh, and we can assist you to track down that information. Now, the committee chair is obviously the most powerful person of the committee. They get to set the agenda and decide if and when bills get heard. So each week, um, there's a deadline for uh, when, when committees are meeting in the legislature, there's a deadline for committee chairs to issue their agenda. Generally speaking, it comes out the same time every week. Um, so league staff is here to track and monitor those agendas to uh, inform you all of when bills of particular interest to municipal government ends up on one of those agendas and we need to start counting votes, talking to legislators and uh, drafting any amendments or, or otherwise. Um, committee chair doesn't have to schedule the bill. He can put it, he or she can put it in a drawer somewhere and just not hear it. Doesn't, it doesn't mean that if the speaker or the president assigns a bill to a committee that it's going to be heard. Uh, and, and, and because that role is so powerful, um, they really are the, the you know, determining factor as, as to whether a bill moves forward or not. Uh, so if a bill doesn't get heard, um, it's dead. Chances are, but there are other ways to revive issues. Uh, what I always say is no, no issue is ever dead until sine die. 
And, and like I said before, some of these issues can come back in following sessions. So just because one bill uh, that contained one particular issue doesn't get heard in time, doesn't mean that that bill is actually dead. It can come back as a striker in the same session, or it can just come back in the next session and we have to face it again. So before the committee hearing, um, this is when we know that a bill has been scheduled, it's been agendized, uh, there's a lot of work that's be, that, that has to be done. Um, lobbyists such as myself, uh, we try to meet with legislators prior to the hearing to try to get a count votes if we're, we're trying to defeat that measure or try to get a sense of where legislators are in terms of you know, what we're trying, what our issue is that we're trying to champion. Um, you know, from there, we may, if, if the votes just aren't there, um, we may try to seek uh, an amendment that will uh, satisfy the concerns of the legislators that have told us that they're going to vote no. Um, generally speaking, uh, amendments, committee amendments, uh, will have varying deadlines. Uh, you'll want to check the committee's rules. Uh, league staff, we compile all the uh, committee agenda and striker and committee amendment deadlines. So, um, so we'll, we'll always know when that deadline is. But uh, generally speaking, in the House, for House committees, it's usually about noon the day before uh, the, the, the committee is scheduled for just committee amendments. Uh, strike everything amendments, it's generally about 4 or 5 p.m., two business days before uh, the, the committee is going to meet. Um, committee staff uh, works to summarize each bill that is scheduled for a committee hearing. So you'll go on the legislature's website, you'll probably see either uh, House or Senate fact sheets. They are there for the public to consume and get a better understanding of the legislation that uh, the committee is going to be discussing. Um, so now let's talk about committee hearing, the day of. This is the, really the only opportunity that the public has to weigh in on the issue, to make their comments. Uh, they can't do that on the House or the Senate floor. Um, other than that, they can submit letters, email their elected officials, but this is the best and really the only opportunity for the public, for lobbyists to state our facts, uh, state, make our claim uh, for or against a measure uh, in, in a public setting and so that it's on the record. Now, during the committee, this is where the amendments are offered. Um, strike everything's, as I said, uh, these, these amendments essentially are meant to erase the entire uh, subject matter and language of a bill and replace it with a completely new subject and language. So um, these are the tactic that is used towards you know, the end of session, uh, when committees are starting to wrap up, usually the last week of committees, we see a lot of strikers that are trying to revive bills that have either previously uh, defeated in one of the other chambers or in a committee. Um, and, and this is used quite often the last week um, for committees. League staff is on high alert watching for strikers to make sure that you know, bills that we've opposed and defeated don't come back in some form or fashion. Uh, and lastly, this is uh, where the committee makes a recommendation. Uh, they, that, that's their vote. Uh, they either vote to um, give it a due pass recommendation, um, or they can fail the bill, or they can, and in, in some cases, they can recommend to the committee that it be given a do not pass recommendation. And so when that happens, bill still moves on, goes to the full house where, it, whether it was given a do not pass recommendation or a do pass recommendation, the, um, that is where the entire legislative body, the, the house or the Senate has the opportunity to uh, make a debate, uh, offer more amendments if 
they weren't made in the committee hearing, or perhaps a legislator who wasn't on the committee that had jurisdiction over this bill can actually weigh in on this issue. Now comes rules. So before, um, in the previous slide, I had mentioned that uh, the, the committee chair is very, very powerful. They get to decide whether a bill moves forward or not. Um, they can put it on the agenda or they can decide not to. Rules committee, because every single bill has to go through um, this committee. Uh, this is the committee that um, has attorneys assigned to ensure that the bill is constitutional and in proper form. Uh, and the, those attorneys can uh, rec make recommendations, they can give opinion to uh, the members of the Rules Committee and say, we think that there are constitutional issues um, that could be remedied with an amendment, or perhaps maybe the entire bill is just uh, patently unconstitutional. Um, there's, there's, um, there's a few different variations there, but generally speaking, the, uh, the rules attorneys, the, it's just their opinion that they're giving to the, the body. Um, so a bill can be unconstitutional and still pass the rules committee and, and continue on and become state law. Uh, it's only until a court has uh, deemed it unconstitutional that the that the law will not be standing. But um, for the power of the Rules Committee chair, because every single bill has to go through the Rules Committee, if the committee chair decides not to put it on the agenda, it's dead. It's not going anywhere. Uh, it's it's dead. It's it's not moving. Um, and so that gives a, this particular chairman a whole lot of power to either kill a bill or to slow it down significantly so it becomes more troublesome for it to get passed and meet the deadlines uh, to get it over to the other chamber. Uh, next, caucus. That's where the parties divide. and uh, They uh, sit in a room and discuss the merits of a bill and vet the party platform against those merits. And this is also an opportunity for not only partisan staff, but leadership to kind of get a sense of where the votes are uh, within the caucus. And the whip's job, the whip is in charge of the caucus meetings. Uh, their job is essentially to whip, whip the votes, whip the, whip the caucus and make sure that they are uh, voting on party lines and, um, and and making sure that they that there are enough votes for um, either a leadership bill or Republican or Democrat bill to uh, move forward in the process. Now comes Committee of the Whole. Now this is where the entire body comes together uh, on the floor and debates the issues. So. Um, this is really the only opportunity for the entire body to discuss issues um, and, and really in a public forum. And so the, the public can sit up in the gallery and watch. Uh, like I said before, um, no public comment is taken during this time. This is just for the legislator and their colleagues to discuss the issue. Uh, generally speaking, the chairman, when a bill comes up, the chairman of the committee that had jurisdiction of the bill is the one that's going to move it. Uh, amendments can be offered. And this is the opportunity where every single amendment that's been offered on a bill is voted on. As I said before, committee amendments, they are just recommendations to the committee of the whole. To, as to how to amend the bill to remedy some issue. It does not mean that when the standing committee adopts that amendment that the bill, the amendment has been inserted into the bill. This, that is not where that happens. It's committee of the whole is where this happens. So if a, an amendment was adopted in committee, it comes to the floor, everybody in the committee of the whole has to, there has to be a majority vote um, in order to uh, move that amendment um, onto the bill. 
And this is the opportunity, again, like I said, you know, maybe discuss the issues, debate. Um, debate's not really limited during this time. So you could see floor sessions going on for a very, very long time. Some are just really quick. It's just procedural, make motion, vote on it. The bill continues on. Other times it's hours and hours of debate, uh, procedural motions, um, you name it. Um, and so you know, about the time when budget session starts, that's when you tend to see very long sessions that run into the early morning hours and, and it really takes a long time. So after Committee of the Whole, all the amendments are voted on, they're approved, uh, the bill has been approved as amended, now it goes to engrossing. That's where uh, engrossing clerks take all the amendments that have been approved, bring it all in and, and engross it into the bill. So the final product is the legislative language that includes all the changes that were made either by the Committee of the Whole or by the, uh, the, the standing committee. So it's, uh, it'll be, so if, it, if it, the bill was in the house, it'll end up being a house and gross version. And so that's where if you are reading it, you, read the, you can read the entire thing with the uh, amendments included. After it's engrossed, it goes to a third reading. Now this is the, the final vote uh, that is taken within the chamber. Um, so this is, and you know, if you're, you're sitting in the gallery in either the House or the Senate, you'll see uh, all the legislators' names come up and you can see it, whether they voted yay or nay on a particular issue uh, before it continues on. If it doesn't pass third read, it doesn't continue on. Um, it can be reconsidered if it fails to pass third read. Um, it just by a motion with a voice vote can bring this back on a third read calendar for another day for another vote. Gives enough time for leadership or the whip uh, to uh, count votes and get more support so uh, the bill can pass. Now, this simple math to get a law passed in Arizona is 31-16-1. 31 votes you need in the House, that's majority, 16 votes in the Senate, again majority, and one signature of the governor. Uh, there are exceptions to that. Uh, for instance, you'll need a two-thirds vote, which would be 20 in the Senate and 40 in the House. If you have a particular issue that has a Prop 108 clause on it. And what Prop 108 is, is a restriction on the legislature for passing any new taxes or increasing or establishing any new uh, statutory fees. Um, Prop 108, um, again, needs 20 votes in the Senate, 40 in the House. Uh, a good example, uh, there are, ways around a Prop 108, and we saw that with the highway safety fee. That's the $32 that everybody's paying now for uh, DPS and highway patrol. You pay on your car registration. Um, that did not need to have a Prop 108 because the bill called for or delegated the authority to an agency head to establish that fee. So in other words, it, it didn't need uh, Prop 108 and therefore did not trigger a two-thirds vote. Um, if it contains a Prop 105 clause, it requires a supermajority vote. So 45 votes uh, in the House. Now Prop 105 is, uh, restricts the legislature from amending or repealing any voter protected initiatives. So they are restricted only to amending those initiatives that, um, and, and those amendments have to further the purpose of the intention of the voters. Um, and in order to pass that, uh, you need a supermajority vote. So what happens after bill passes uh, the chamber of origin? Um, it has, each bill has to be heard in both chambers. They both have to vote on identical language. So if you have a bill that starts in the house, goes through third read, 
uh, or first Cal had amendments, go through third read. Then it goes to the Senate and it goes through that same process over again. Um, same thing for the Senate. It starts there, goes through committee, Cal, third read, and then it goes to the House and gets assigned. Um, there are deadlines for when a bill has to get through the process in one chamber and over to the next. Uh, generally speaking, uh, mid-February is when the Chamber of Origin has to finish their business on committees and for, for, their, for their bills and get them through the process and get them over to the, the other chamber to meet the other deadline, which is generally about the end of March, when that is the last opportunity for those chambers to hear the opposing chambers' bills in committee. So in other words, if a bill does not make those deadlines, it's essentially dead. What we've seen, um, a tactic, as I just mentioned before, the strikers, if perhaps uh, an issue had gotten stalled in the House and they want to keep it going, uh, didn't quite make it over to uh, the Senate in time, um, and it's still locked up in the House, they can offer a strike everything amendment um, on a House bill in the Senate to keep that issue moving. Although that bill has to go back to uh, the chamber of origin, because like I said, each chamber has to vote on identical language. They have to vote on the same version of the bill. If they don't, um, well, actually, they have to in every case. But if for some reason, um, the, when the bill comes back to the originating chamber and that chamber says, no, we don't agree with the other chamber's amendments, it goes to what is known as uh, a conference committee. Um, and so, like I said, you know, this is uh, the process that um, the bills go through in the opposite chamber. They go through the same, same, same process. After it passes both, um, if there were no amendments, if, if, if the other chamber passes it, no amendments, it'll go back to the originating chamber. It's read across the uh, presiding officer's desk and it gets sent to the governor. If, the, if it did have amendments, as I was saying before, the sponsor of the bill has to concur or refuse those amendments. If the sponsor concurs, it'll go to a final vote because like I said, each chamber has to vote on identical language. So the final vote is that chamber making their final vote on that piece of legislation before it goes up to the governor. If the sponsor refuses, then that's when the conference committee is appointed. Um, conference committees are um, appointed by the speaker and the president. Generally speaking, the sponsor of the bill is the, the chair on, um, on, on the House. If, if it was a House bill, it would be the, the sponsor of the House Conference Committee. President of the Senate appoints uh, a co-chair and two other members uh, as well. That body comes and, and meets to try to work out the issue uh, if and, and offer an amendment or they can go with a previous version of the bill. When these, when they meet, they are meeting together but as separate bodies. So they're, they're in the same conference room but they are both gaveling into uh, their respective meeting um, and they take separate votes. So you could potentially have the House Conference Committee approve a conference committee amendment and the Senate side refuse that amendment. And when that happens, the bill's dead. It doesn't go any further because there was no agreement. Um, there are procedural motions that can be made if perhaps the sponsor uh, changes their mind, they can go back to the floor. Sponsor makes a motion to say, I now concur with the opposing chambers amendments and it can go to a final bill. Um, we talked a little bit about conference committees. Again, um, 
like I said, these are, um, you know, it can be, uh, consist of three to five members appointed by the Senate and the president. They come, they meet in committee, they operate as two separate bodies. Uh, they have to take a vote. If, if they vote in favor of an, an amendment to that bill, what happens after that is the bill goes back to their um, goes back to the caucuses in both chambers. And so they discuss what happened in the conference committee. Um, and then after that, it'll go to a final vote in both chambers before it gets sent to the governor. So now any bill that reaches the governor's desk, um, after passing each chamber in an identical form, like I said, um, it, it goes directly, it, it'll go back to the originating chamber. The, the presiding officer reads it across their desk and it goes up to the governor. Uh, if it's amended in the opposite chamber um, and then the sponsor concurs in the originating chamber that they approve the amendments, then a final vote is taken and it goes up to uh, the governor. And then the third option is if those amendments are rejected, then it goes through the conference committee process. Now, the governor uh, can, can take a few different actions, obviously signing the bill. That means that the bill goes into law within 90 days. Uh, they can veto the bill. The bill does not become law. Um, they do have, uh, the governor does have a, a time limitation for either signing or vetoing a bill. Um, it is 10 days after, uh, if, this, if the legislature adjourns sine die, the governor has 10 days to take action, either sign or veto the bill. During the legislative session, the governor has five days to sign or veto the bill. Now, that time can be extended, say, for instance, if during the legislature still in session, they're transmitting bills to the governor and uh, during that time, you know, maybe two days have passed, but then the um, legislature adjourns sine die. Well, that clock restarts. So now they, the governor had two, had five days, two days were lapsed. Now the governor has 10 days to either sign or veto the bill. Um, Arizona is not like other states. Uh, we're not a pocket veto state where if the governor just decides to not take any action, then the bill doesn't go into law. That's not what happens in Arizona. If, if the governor takes no action within the time allotted, then the bill can go, goes into law without with signature. Uh, I can only think of one other time, I think it was when Governor Napolitano was governor, I can only think of one other time during her administration that a bill uh, intentionally went into law without signature. And in fact, there was a letter that was signed by her uh, stating her reasons why she did not um, sign, sign that bill and just let it go into law um, pending any court action. Uh, effective dates, 90, generally speaking, 90 days after signing dies. So, you know, Let's say a bill, um, you know, passed early on in the session. That does not mean, and was signed by the governor. That doesn't mean that after um, the governor's signature, then 90 days after that, it goes into law. No, it's 90 days after signing die. And much like uh, for cities and towns, uh, when you pass ordinances, uh, the purpose of that 90-day time frame is to allow the public to uh, gather signatures. Um, to, to file a referendum. A uh, recent example of that was the ESA expansion bill. Uh, I believe it was Prop 305. Um, voters rejected it uh, at the general election in November. Um, so that's an example of a, a, a referendum that had, had gone to the voters. Um, bills that have emergency clauses, if they are, um, if they receive a two thirds vote, then as soon as the governor signs it, it becomes effective immediately. Um, we'll skip over these deadlines. They've not been updated, but just generally speaking, the uh, deadlines that we care about are 
Uh, this year, January 14th, is going to be the start of session. Um, committee deadlines, um, mid-February is the deadline for the committees in the, uh, or, or for committees in the originating chamber to hear the bills. Uh, and then towards the end of March is going to be uh, the deadline to hear bills from the opposing chamber. Uh, session 100 days. We hope it's only 100. Um, there's been only once in my time at the legislature that it's been less than 100 days, uh, somewhere around 85, which uh, was a blessing. So we hope that um, we're, we don't go much further than that this year. We all get to go home. Damage has been done uh, and, and no more. Um, and so if you are looking for any more information about the legislative process or simply what the league is doing at the legislature, you can visit our website, uh, azleague.org. We have our municipal policy statement uploaded already for the 2019 session. Uh, and that'll give you just an overview of some of the resolutions that were passed at the annual conference. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can contact league staff, league legislative staff, you can contact myself, uh, Tom Savage, Nick Ponder, or Alex Vidal. If you have any questions about uh, any bills that have been introduced, uh, if you'd like a summary on the impact, or you know, just general questions about the legislature, you know, that, that's what we're here for. Give us, uh, give us a call. Uh, azledge.gov, that's where you're going to find um, the, the bill summaries that I talked about um, when, when bills are assigned to a committee. Uh, you'll, you'll likely find a summary of that bill. Um, that's on the AZ Ledge website. They also have a free bill tracking uh, app that you can use. Um, you just need to create a profile and you can start uh, tracking bills through, uh, through that platform um, and, and you'll get the, the bill text, the amendments, the summaries. Uh, there's even an option on there for you to select if you wanna get any alerts, if, if a bill's been um, placed on a calendar or on a committee agenda, you'll probably get a, an alert um, and then also you can check out uh, the Capital Times website. Um, they're, they're a pretty good source of news. Uh, they're solely uh, keeping their eye on the legislature and the executive branch um, and, and sometimes the uh, judiciary. Um, so they are a good source of information if, you know, any hot button issues that are at the Capitol, um, they can kind of give you the, the, uh, the, the happenings. Uh, other ways that you can get involved, every week we have a legislative bulletin that's compiled by league staff. That is, uh, for the most part, it's going to give you an overview of anything that's of particular interest to cities and towns. So if there's a bill that we are actively counting votes in opposition to, you know, we'll inform you. Uh, you know, what the bill does, what league staff is doing, how you can be helpful. Uh, we may uh, put in there a call to action, which means we want you to get in contact with your legislative delegation and explain to them the, the provisions of the bill and why it would be harmful to cities and towns. Um, legislators really want to hear from their elected officials, and our political capital lies with our city and towns, our, our mayors and councils. And so uh, oftentimes we may have to reach out to you uh, for assistance on really conveying uh, important messages to legislators. Sometimes they get, they, they get really tired of talking to lobbyists. They wanna hear from their, the, those that are in their districts, their elected officials. We do a Monday morning call uh, where we kind of do a brief overview of the issues that are going to come up in that during that week. So uh, if there's committees that are scheduled with bills that um, either we are support or against, uh, we'll update you on the status of those bills. Um, 
Intergovs, if you are a city that has an intergov, we interface with them quite a bit and we, you know, request information from them on how, you know, bills are going to impact your community. Uh, we meet every Friday to have discussions. So if, um, and, and we send out an agenda and we, you know, talk about, um, you know, bills that are coming up in the next week, that's generally when we'll know, um, we'll have every single agenda for the committees during the following week. We go through each of those agendas to see uh, which bills are of particular interest to us, which are gonna be big problems, um, and then we decide how the appropriate action uh, to take on, that, on those pieces of legislation. Request to speak. Um, we are here to help you get signed up for that. Um, I talked a little bit about the, the BSI program on the AZ Ledge website. The RTS is a component of the um, AZ Ledge website. Uh, if you, um, you can sign up remotely for the bill status app, but you cannot sign up remotely for request to speak. If you are intending on coming down to the Capitol to uh, register position and testifying committee, um, you will need to come down uh, to the Capitol and sign up on one of the computers in either the House or the Senate. You only have to do that once. After that, you can log in and register uh, positions on bills and request to speak on a bill. Uh, if you are out of the Phoenix area, we can assist you in getting signed up for that service. Uh, give us a call um, and we'll be happy to help you. Um, and that concludes the presentation. And, and uh, like I said, if you have any questions, uh, please give us a call, um, email us and you know, take part in our Monday morning legislative call, uh, you know, read our bulletins. That's the, the best source of information that you know, we can provide. Um, and like I said, we put in our calls to action if we need any assistance from you. Uh, but other than that, we are looking forward to a good session. We hope it's uh, good for local government. Um, we're here to assist you and to advocate for uh, cities and towns. Um, other than that, thank you for tuning in and let us know if you need anything. Thank you.